audience. But now I've got a billion people listening to me, so I need to be on my very best behavior. Rob and I go way back, actually, before Virginia Tech. He was uh, part of the Fannie Mae Foundation, and he and I cavorted on new ideas. We, we studied ex-urban development patterns. We studied demographic patterns, economic development patterns. So we go back quite a ways. And I think we're coming up with very important, interesting insights into how uh, the United States is growing and changing in very important ways. So my presentation today will run about, I think Rob told me, two and a half hours. <laughs> Standard lecture time for me. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that Jason comes from the University of Utah. I will tell you that Utah is worried about only one state competitively in its, in its uh, next 30, 40 year future. It's not Colorado, it's not Arizona, it's not California. We're actually, we're, take, we're stealing from California. It is Nevada, and it, particularly it's the Las Vegas metropolitan area that the whole state of, Nevada, of Utah is concerned about competing with in, in the future. So I'll start my presentation with uh, a discussion about the growth uh, currently or the, over the next 20 years in the Las Vegas combined metropolitan statistical area of the CSA that now straddles two states. I was asked to talk about the economic development role of place making and transit-oriented developments. So I'll talk with you about that, especially the new research we've generated out of my shop at Utah, the Metropolitan Research Center. Then we'll talk about, I'll talk about a new measure of compactness, which is a multi-variable measure of urban form. Uh, and I won't go through the mathematical details. Actually, I can't, because we have a physicist in our shop doing the, the mathematics for us. But I am in charge of interpreting his work for people like you and me. So I'll share that interpretation with you and what it means for the Las Vegas metropolitan area. Then I'll combine all of these features and sort of hypothesize on the nature or the, or the, the economic development benefits of achieving a more compact development pattern uh, in the Las Vegas metropolitan area in hard and fast numbers and opportunities. But first, I want to talk about the book that Rob mentioned, uh, Megapolitan America, published by the American Planning Association a couple of years ago. Uh, he put me first, thank you very much, Rob, because I was the back office. Rob was the front man, you know, as Rob is, we all know. Uh, I was with the, with the green eye shades in the back office uh, crunching the numbers, and so Rob said one day, maybe you ought to be the first listed, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Rob. But here's our map. Uh, our, this is the map of the 23 megapolitan areas uh, that we've decided uh, are functional economic units in the United States. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this because I think it's very important for you all to know your place in the American economic development future. So here is Las Vegas megapolitan area. We say megapolitan because megapolitan means multiple metropolitan areas stitched together in a common economic, cultural, climate, terrain network. You talk to each other across state borders. You talk to each other uh, lengthwise across your metropolitan area. So we have, uh, you, you're part of the southwest uh, megapolitan region, which consists of Southern California, Los Angeles, Las Vegas principally, the Sun Corridor, which Rob Lang actually invented the name of, and the governor and the uh, university president are stole the name uh, unfair and unsquare. Uh, so it belongs to Rob. Phoenix to Tucson, of course. And, and then we have the, the uh, Las Vegas me uh, mega, me megapolitan area here. Uh, we have other megapolitan areas. I live in one, the Wasatch Range. There's several around the country. But look what's missing. Now, our minimum threshold for a megapolitan area is 4 million people by 2040. Well, and they have to be 180 miles apart between the two largest megapolitan, metropolitan areas. Here's St. Louis, here's Kansas City, it's a 160 mile distance and they are not a megapolitan area. They have in, megapolitan envy. <laughs> They're talking to Rob and me about a contract to find a way to have them become megapolitan. Uh, they, you know, the zeros keep adding up because we can't make it work. The problem is that St. Louis, if anybody knows Missouri, 
You all know that St. Louis and Kansas City do not talk to each other. They basically should be in different time zones. As a matter of fact, the Federal Reserve Board that has uh, 11 or so specialized branches all around the country, specializing in understanding the economies of the regions. Kansas is one of the few states that has two of them. One is in St. Louis. That's basically uh, focusing on the industrial, uh, the old industrial heartland. And the other one is Kansas City that's focusing on the uh, agricultural prairie economies. They're so different, they don't talk to each other. Nashville and Memphis don't talk to each other. But, you know, you all in Las Vegas do talk to each other across a large span uh, of distance, uh, Sun Corridor, and so on and so forth. So, our, what we're saying to Congress, to legislators, to anybody who will listen to you all here, to the people listening to us, is that we need to focus our marginal resources, the resources we have left over in this economy, to invest in areas where people are and where growth is occurring, not where people aren't or where growth isn't happening. So if you add up the 23 areas, the megapolitan areas, the land area, excluding the large federal land ownerships, that's not fair. If you add up the privately owned land of the 23 <laughs> megapolitan regions that we've identified, they are about the same space as France and the low countries in Europe. Now, those, five, those four countries, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France, have about 80 million people in them same land area as the 23 megapolitan areas we have in the U.S. Our megapolitan areas are home to 200 million people, two and a half times more. The urban forms are very different, obviously, but we have more people in the same space. Uh, and so we need to focus our attention nationally across states, uh, locally and so forth, into investing where the future is, and the future are places like here, where I live now, Utah, and, and elsewhere around the country. Now, Rob did put a plug in for my book. Thank you very much, Rob, again for that. Uh, reshaping Metropolitan America is looking to the year 2030, between 2010 and 2030, looking at the population change, household change, ethnicity change. I'll, I'm going to give you a lot of those numbers here in the context of the Las Vegas combined uh, statistical area. Uh, now, I urge you to buy the book. It's published by Island Press. It's, uh, it's online, you know, islandpress.com. Look me up, Nelson, Reshipping Metropolitan America. Because I pledge a large share of the proceeds to two scholarships I have at the University of Utah. So do me a favor, do my students a favor, buy hundreds of these books, please. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, the Las Vegas CSA uh, in, in the context especially of the state. These are projections, and by the way, um, I do, uh, I, I like using Woods and Cool um, Economics out of Washington, D.C. They're the only apples to apples projection firm in the U.S. You know, every state has its own projection outfit. You do, we do in Utah. Uh, every state has its own economic projection outfit. Sometimes they're different than the, the population projection outfit. It's, you know, I don't know why. Uh, they all they use different uh, methodologies, different databases, and so they all, they're all different. And so when you look at their performance over time, several states are very, well, most states don't do very well over time in, in, a, in their projections. Woods and Pool, by and large, is the most accurate projection firm across time than most states. Now, I haven't looked at Nevada. Uh, they also use a constant methodology, and so for my national analytic purposes, I use Woods and Pool to understand an apples to apples projection methodology. So looking at Woods and Pool, uh, between 2010 and 2000, that should be 30, uh, you know, the U.S. will grow six, by 65 million people. Uh, Nevada will add about a million people. Uh, this, this area, the Las Vegas CSA, will add about 800,000 people. So in other words, this part of the country, this, this part of the state will, will actually account for 77% of the growth of Nevada. Now, if you dispute that, come see me afterwards. Um, we look at the, uh, uh, the, 
the, the population change among the white, non-Hispanic, and the all other minority, which I actually nowadays call the new majority. You know, by the year 2043, according to the census, and maybe even before then, minorities will outnumber white non-Hispanics. So I ask myself, why are we calling them minority if they're most of the people in this country? And you know, we're not, I am not. Uh, so I'm calling this other group the new majority because they're going to be the majority. That's the fact of life. So it turns out that uh, the new majority population growth in this state, 70% of that population growth will occur in the Las Vegas CSA. And in terms of the population over, over 65, which is the largest growing population base, as we all know, 73% of the net change in that age group in population will occur uh, in the Las Vegas area. Let's look at households by type. These are households with children, households without children, and single person households who are a subset of households with children. So between 2010 and 2030, this metropolitan area will add about 75,000 new households with children. But that's only 24% of the total net change in households. So I advise, I advise real estate investment trusts and builders around the country. I'm advising my clientele, be very careful the kind of home you build because though you're building based on a past or maybe current sense of where the market is, understand that the market is going to, in this case, 75% of the net change in all households in this metropolitan area will be households without children between now and 2030. I hypothesize that households without children have a different kind of demand function for housing than households with children. Now, households without children have already raised their children, and so they're really becoming empty nesters and aging along, or their household, households who have not yet started raising children, or in many cases these days are households who will never raise children. Now it turns out that the Las Vegas metropolitan area will fare far better than the nation as a whole, and a little better than Nevada, because basically it is Nevada, in terms of this, uh, of this metric. For the nation as a whole, only 14% of the net change in households will, will have children in, in them between 2010 and 2030. So we are a younger population here and adding more children per, populate, per household here than the, than the nation as a whole. Uh, the one I'd like to point out is the gross share of single person households. More than half of the net change in households in the U.S. as a whole will be single person households. Uh, they have very different housing demand functions than house, other households, uh, paired up households, households with children, and so forth. But the Las Vegas area will actually be a laggard. Only 38% of the net change in households here will be single person. Again, you're younger. You're importing talent from all around the country, maybe even Salt Lake City, heaven forbid. Uh, and so you're a younger, more dynamic metropolitan area than, than most of the rest of the nation. I think other, other metropolitan areas like you would be Austin, Orlando, and maybe that's it, right? Maybe that's it. So you're in fast company. So when I look at, uh, when I look at housing demand also, I, look at, I, I divide the population up into three very crude uh, age groups. Households with household heads under 35, I call them starter home households. Those between 35 and 64, I call them peak demand households. These are households that have, you know, a mother, father, or a couple of people are adding children. They need space. They have the money. It's sort of like the, the, the I guess, the, the perfect crime in a sense. They have the motive. They need space. They have the means. They have an income. It used to be good incomes. Maybe around here you have good incomes, and maybe two incomes. And they have the opportunity with builders providing good quality products uh, that met their needs. Uh, then we have the empty nesting downsizing group, those over 65. They've raised their children. They don't want to maintain their half acre, third acre, whatever it is. They don't want to maintain their 4,000, 3,000 square foot house. They're downsizing empty nesting. So we need to understand where these markets are, where they've been in the past, and where they're heading in the future. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this. Between 1990 and 2010, 
for the U.S. as a whole, there was a negative change in starter home households. Now, starter home households demand apartments, condos, townhouses, small lots, small homes, and the rest of it. Between 1990 and 2010, we had, a, we had record low productions of apartment units. Well, why is that? Well, it's because we weren't adding any households in that uh, housing demand uh, area. Uh, in contrast, the peak demand households comprise 77% of the demand for all new housing between 1990 and 2010 for the nation as a whole. And you'll wonder why we have suburban development. We did a very good job, thank you very much, of meeting demand with supply. And so the, uh, America became a suburban, even exurban nation between 1990 and 2010, and many of my planning colleagues bemoan the expansion of suburbia. No, it's a natural market response to natural market demands. We met that demand, thank you very much. But the demand is changing, and we need to be prepared for that too. Between 1990 and 2010, the households uh, over 65 were less than a quarter of the net change. Well, fast forward, nation as a whole, between 2010 and 2030, starter households will account for 10% of the net change in total households. And so, ooh, suddenly we're seeing an uptick in, in apartment demand. Duh. But look at the net change in the number of households who are at their peak period of life looking for homes. There'll be 16%, about one-fifth of what they were in the last 20 years We'll see basically 5 million new home demand for, for peak demand household units between 2010 and 2030 compared to 20 million net demand in the past 20 years. So the overall national demand for the larger homes, larger lots is basically collapsing. So if you're in a metropolitan area where the builders, the suburban communities, the whole system is designing and building, more and more homes like meeting the demand for the past, they are in for another crash that I predict will occur between 2016 and 2020. I'm sorry about that. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, Kay Benfield, in an article he just posted in the Atlantic Cities blog a few days ago, I didn't know this. He was in some session I did like this in, in 2005. Uh, he said that I predicted America's housing collapse almost to the year. I, you know, he reminded me about that in his, in his article. Now, in 2006, I published an article in the uh, Journal of the American Planning Association showing the 30 million home mismatch by 2025 between single-family detached homes and large lots relative to demand for attached products, condo, townhouse, apartment, and small lot under one-sixth of an acre lot uh, demand. Well, sure enough, we are now eating those uh, excess capacity homes around the country. So for the nation as a whole, between 2010 and, and, uh, and uh, 2010 and 2030, about three-quarters of the net change in demand for housing will be to accommodate the needs of empty nesting downsizing households. Again, now we see the rise of apartment demand, independent living, assisted living, and so on. That is the market for most metropolitan areas of the country. But it's a little different here. Look at the numbers. Uh, your starter household demand will be 22%. You know, give or take a couple points. Maybe a quarter of your net housing demand to, to, to 2030 will be for starter homes. Therefore, you need more apartments, maybe more condos and townhouses, maybe more small lot homes on sm uh, and small homes than the nation as a whole. Uh, your demand for the households in the peak share is over a third. You'll see very healthy demand, thankfully not hyper demand like it used to be for the U.S., but very healthy steady demand for the peak housing households. And you'll see a, you know, a sizable but not dominant demand for the empty nesting downsizing part of the population. In other words, you're balanced. You're maybe one of the most balanced metropolitan areas in the country. Now, I wouldn't say that on the strip, 
but I say that to you all here. Now, we're also looking at another kind of dynamic, and that is the change in home ownership patterns. Uh, we skyrocketed in our home uh, ownership in 2005 at 69% for the nation as a whole. We've been tailing off ever since. I've got a whole lecture on that. That's why I was going to go two and a half hours, but I'm told I, I can't do that. So the, the, the short story is that we, for the nation as a whole, we will drop from 65.1% home ownership rate in, in 2010 to 63.1% in 2030. Now, I think that's optimistic. My own numbers indicate it could be down as low as 60% for this simple reason. If you look at the home ownership rate by race and ethnicity in 2010, now white non-Hispanics for the U.S. as a whole own their homes at a 74% rate in 2010, all the other new majority households were at about a 46% ownership rate. Got that picture? If most of our growth is going to be among the new majority, and the home ownership rates are far less than white and Hispanics, and there's another lecture on the reasons why that is, shouldn't be, but is, and we need to fix that. We can fix that, but we won't. If you run those numbers out using the 2010 home ownership rates, you get to 63% by 2030. But if you take the 2012 homeownership rates as the new normal, and a lot of people are saying that's the new normal. Actually, we're not even at the new normal yet. The new normal will be, will, will be about 2015, 2014, according to Prudential Real Estate. We could be looking at homeownership rates at about 60% for the U.S. Well, let's, let's do the optimistic number. The rate only drops by two points. That means for the U.S. as a whole, about half of all new housing demand will be for rental housing. Not that we're going to build half of all new housing as apartments, but millions of currently owner-occupied single-family homes will turn into renter-occupied homes or subject to zoning codes and zoning enforcement, uh, homes with split tenure, the owner renting a piece of the home out to somebody else. Already we find across the country zoning codes ratcheting up the so-called blood test. So I can see some point in time where the owner of a house who wants to keep owning the house and live in the house, maybe age in place and so on and so forth, wants to rent a piece of the house out to a young family or another empty nest or you know, person, whatever. They'll be in violation of the zoning code, and so the zoning enforcement officer will come knocking on the door with her or his blood litmus test to check out the occupancy bloodlines. Um, that's what these zoning codes will lead us to in their logical extreme. The Las Vegas area has historically had far less ownership rate than the, than the nation as a whole, uh, and you'll also see a decline in home ownership rates. And again, like the U.S. as a whole, about half of your net new demand for housing will be for rental housing. So this is, in this respect, you're very close uh, to the national average. Then let's look at jobs and non-residential space. Um, the U.S., Nevada, Las Vegas will see pretty healthy job growth. Uh, and again, the uh, Las Vegas metropolitan area will account for about three quarters of all new jobs in the state between 2010 uh, and 2030. But what I like to look at is the, you know, those net new jobs will need new space, buildings like this, uh, and so forth. So we'll have to add about 275 million square feet of total space to accommodate these new jobs in this metropolitan area. But between 2010 and 2030, we will tear down and rebuild 407 million square feet of existing non-residential space. And actually, maybe more because, at least on the strip, you tear down a building every five years, it seems. Every time I come here, you've, a big 40 foot building is gone. Where'd it go? Oh, there's an 8 foot building being planned over there. Oh, that's where it went. So you'll be tearing down and rebuilding with the consequence that you'll be building about 700 million square feet of total non-residential space between 2010 and 2030, which is 1.3 times 
the total amount of space that existed in 2010. Now back the unvolt numbers between total new non-residential space and total new residential development, you will spend in this metropolitan area about $400 billion in construction, not land, just construction and infrastructure between 2010 and 2030. That's about 85%, roughly speaking, of the state as a whole. So let's talk about place making, place making principles, how the market responds to place making. Place making is all about, well, making places. But places that have, that have destinations, places that have integrated land uses, places that you and I want to live in and, and maybe die in, uh, these are places we want to be, want to work, want to play, and so forth. So the place making principles are composed of these 11 uh, parts. I'm going to talk about you know, all of them in detail, but they're sociable, meaning that you want, you want to live there and you want other people to live there. They're flexible and adaptable. Times change, things change, so these places have to change too. Uh, focused on creating destinations. You want to go to these places, not away from them. You want to go to live to these places or go to work to these places. Uh, so many parts of this country, I know people by the millions who want to leave where they live to go work or vice versa because they're incompatibly designed. Um, culturally aware and so on and so forth. Let's go on to some more things. So part of the idea of place making is integrating land uses. Now, my very first career was in the boring profession, to pardon the uh, people who are out here in this profession, called public administration. Uh, the mass in public administration, I was pretty good at it in Oregon in the mid-70s, but I thought, isn't there something more exciting in the world, as in more unpredictable, um, you know? It's called planning. So I started planning about three paradigm shifts ago. That's one thing about public administration. They have not had a paradigm shift since uh, Woodrow Wilson wrote the textbooks in 1890. I'm overstating it. Of course, it's not through paradigm shifts, but you get the idea. Planning, every 10 years, there's a paradigm shift in my, in my field, which makes me, you know, I'm 84 years old. It makes me young, you know. So, uh, facetious again. So, maybe I do look 84. <laughs> So here is the, when I started planning in the, in the mid-70s, this was what we planned, and we were proud of it, All right? Uh, detached residential here, maybe a uh, you know, smaller lot residential here, maybe there were some uh, uh, apartments here, and some uh, this, the shopping center, there's a school in here somewhere. You know, we loved this. The whole textbooks were written about this. Uh, you know, the transportation people designed the world because this made the most sense to them. Well, fast forward now, 40 years, this is what we think is the better solution. You can get from, you can almost walk from one end to the other. You could actually, in good health. All your institutional shopping, office uses are here. You've got plenty of open spaces and everything else. You have a, use, for the same number of housing units, same square feet of uh, office spaces and retail and school and everything else, the same stuff is more integrated here with a lot more benefits for public health, walkability, uh, more uh, multimodal accessibility, biking, walking to various places, and the rest of it. There are economic development consequences of this. So 